Okay, welcome. So this is Dr. Morton doing uh, doing the lecture uh, number two for um, uh, micro two, and uh, so this is uh, we're going to cover um, today. I'm going to talk about want uh, want to make sure everybody's had a chance to set up Teams for the tilt table, and uh, if if you want to do that, if you if you want to. You'll, you will have to come to the lab a little bit, but you can take the tilt tables home and work on them there. Um, and w there's going to be a little bit of a preparation to get the tilt tables up and working, uh, but then we should be uh, in good shape. Um, so, so that's the that's the deal on the tilt tables. I, I think I think you'll really find you'll get a lot of um, knowledge and enjoyment out of uh, setting this up. Uh, there's a fair amount of work to do. Uh, I don't have the, the, the basic codes not really up and running yet, so that's a little bit of a challenge. Uh, but I think we can, I, I, I'm pretty sure we can get there, so I'm not too freaked about it. Um, so, we, of course, we had it all up and running uh, with our other integrated development environment, and so the, the issue is porting it over to the new uh, integrated development environment, and hopefully we'll be able to do that. So I'm very optimistic about that, but we'll see. We may we may run into some difficulty. <laughs> I hope not. Anyway, we shall see. Um, okay, and uh, so yeah, and that's gonna probably keep me busy the next uh, upcoming weeks. In addition to that, we do need to do a little bit of work on the tilt tables. Uh, over the years, we we've we've moved from how we originally implemented them with a little uh, you know whiteboard uh, pushing wires in to uh, get all the connections made to a printed circuit board. Our first printed circuit board uh, we baselined some uh, voltage converters that turned out to be a, a great disappointment so we had to do another one uh, and so most of the boards do not have the new board yet implemented yet um, and so we're gonna do that and hopefully um, we'll get those all hooked up. I, once that all gets done the connections should be pretty robust, and I, I'm really encouraged that uh, that once we get to that point, we're not going to have to deal with a lot of loose wires and things like that. Um, so we'll see. Um, these uh, the touch panels that are on there uh, are going to work through RJ45 connectors, which is pretty good, and th there's actually some um, uh, some. Um, uh, the wires are uh, doubled since we only need four wires and there's eight eight wires in the RJ45 connector. Uh, there's uh, some uh, duplication, which also helps with a little reliability. So anyway, that's how we're those how we're going to do those. Uh, we do, are set up if we break some touch panels that we can order some more and hopefully make that work. We'll see, uh, but really, really, really try and be careful with the touch panels and hopefully we won't we won't break any. Um, they're not super fragile, but uh, if you drop them or if they fall off the table and dangle by their cord, they, they, the cord will typically rip off of the glass. And, uh, and when that happens, it's done. But, and of course, if it falls and hits the floor, it will definitely uh, break. So, uh, but as long as you, you're, you're gentle with it, it should be fine. Um, also, be real careful not to uh, touch the, the plastic uh, ribbon cable from the touch panel with a soldering iron because then it will definitely uh, melt it and screw that up too. So, so we do have to be a little bit careful. Okay, um, having said that, uh, let, me, uh, let me get started. So what I want to, I also want to talk about uh, the GPIO ports and how they get set up on this board. Uh, and, uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the interrupt system on this chip because it is definitely an advanced interrupt system and you should be aware of that. This, this interrupt system is pretty much right up there with this, you know, all the bells and whistles you can want. Um, and, and, then, uh, and then the lab for this week, I'm actually going to cover that in a separate video. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm working on that lab and I'll set it up and I'll, I'll cover that in a separate video. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's just take a quick look at the, basil at the syllabus uh, since I've got it up here. So, uh, so here we are on uh, the 2nd of February. And uh, so this is video number two, interrupts, introduction, tilt table, and uh, oh, the other thing, I definitely want you to form up into teams. So 
Not so. If you're going to do the tilt table, please put a little team together. It can be as few as two people, as many as five, um, and maybe even six, I guess. But I'd prefer you keep it under, keep it five and under. Uh, if you uh, uh, if you don't want to do it, that's fine. Then uh, I will have an alternate uh, final project for you to do. That's basically more of a where you have to write some code for uh, for a, a skittle sorter. And uh, I've defined the skittle sorter. I actually built it, but uh, 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 I actually programmed it with the pick board. Uh, but I'm, I'll have you write the code with the KL25Z, and hopefully uh, I may switch it over to being run by the KL. Well, we actually we actually did another board. Uh, we made a, uh, um, a dedicated uh, board to run the skittle sorter, and it actually hosts a uh, PIC uh, 16F18877 chip that's got 40 pins and uh, has some advanced features. So, uh, so I'll probably use that chip for it in real life, but, uh, but you're going to write code for the KL25Z, and, and we'll pretend that we have interfaced it, and I, I have defined the interface so you can... Uh, so you can reference all the pins and everything. Okay, um, so with that, uh, and, and, and what we'll do in lab today, we're going to do, or this week, we're going to do the uh, RGB LED lab. But uh, I do not have that lab uh, completed yet, so you just have to be a little bit patient. Uh, we will get that done. This lab we're going to do from scratch. Uh, we'll have you uh, uh, type in um, all the instructions and uh, hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully that will go well. I haven't, haven't actually written that lab yet and haven't done the code either. Uh, so I have a little bit to get done by Thursday, but hopefully I'll get that done. All right. Um, so that having been said, I'm going to switch to the slides. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring my face back up and I'm going to shrink myself down. We'll see how this works. May have to move me around a little bit, but it should be good. Okay. All right, something like that, and then I think I'm going to center myself in here. All right. So again, we're going to talk about interrupts, the GPIO ports, and we'll talk a little bit about intro to tilt table. We'll see about that. If we have, how how we do on time. Okay. So the KL25Z, and I've talked some of you know it. It, it is an 80-pin chip. And it's got 128k uh, of flash, and it's got 8k of uh, RAM. I think that's right. I always get confused about the amount of RAM, but I believe it's 8k. Uh, it is an. It has an ARM M0 plus core, which means that the uh, data sheet for the core is an ARM data sheet. The data sheet for all the peripherals, uh, because they were written back in the Freescale days, uh, it's a it's an NXP slash Freescale document now. Uh, this chip has some real distinctives, and it is widely used. Uh, the, the, also, the M0 Plus core is widely used, too. Uh, so there are some real nice features with all that. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, one of the real advantages of this chip is it can get down to very, very low power levels, in, and it has a whole bunch of different levels of sleep, so that, uh, so that you can, uh, for mobile applications, it's really a good choice. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it's it's used a lot. Um, and then uh, it has very advanced interrupts. Uh, it also has very powerful and capable modules. So it's a it's a really good chip. Um, if you need more processing crunch, then you can go up uh, from the KL25Z. Uh, you can go up to uh, to one that has a has a uh, an M an M4. I think yeah, an M5 and an M6, or maybe it's just M. Maybe it's just M4 and M6, but in any event, uh, for sure you can go up to M6, and those have multiple cores, um, so they're they're uh, quite a bit more powerful, and uh, those chips and they're faster clocks, and so those are those are really uh, really pretty powerful chips. They can really do some number crunching. Um, okay, so when when you want to use a GPIO pin on this chip, you have to go through several steps. Um, and uh, first you have to turn the clock onto the port. Otherwise you can't configure anything even. Then you have to set the, the pin multiplexer so that the port so that the pin is in GPIO mode. 
By default, it's not. By default, it's in an analog function if it has an analog function or a few other functions, but none of the default settings default to GPIO. So if you, if you want to use the pins as a GPIO uh, input, output, you have to set it in the multiplexer to GPIO mode. Uh, and then if you, you probably a good idea to set, well, you, I probably should reverse the order, but you definitely should set the pin direction, whether it's going to be an output or an input, and then you should set your initial output state if it's in output mode. Obviously, if it's in input mode, you don't have to do that. Then when you use the pin as an output, then you generally, uh, you don't write directly to the, to the, to the pin, although you can. Uh, but what you typically do is you use a, a different port. And the nice feature about that port is you write a 1 in all cases. So whether you're going to set a bit, clear a bit, or toggle a bit, you just write a 1 to that bit position, but you use a different register. So when you want to set bits, use the, in the case of, say, port A, GPIO A underscore pin set output register, uh, you, you write a 1 to every bit position that you want to set to a 1 on the output, or a high, however you want to call that. If you want to clear the bits, set them to 0, then you write a 1 everywhere, then you write a 1 to every bit position you want to clear in GPIOA underscore PCOR, pin clear output register. So pin set, output register, pin clear, output register, and then if you just want to toggle a bit, you write a 1 to every pin where you want to pin toggle the output register. So th that that's kind of nice, that way you don't have to, uh, you don't have to, to do R's, ands, with an inverted mask and exclusive ORs uh, for toggling, so that that really does that really does make it a little easier, and it's nice. So these ports are are uh, are part of the hardware, and you just write to those ports, and that makes it happen. Um, so. Um, so you again, you can you there is a register where you can write directly to the pin, so that's fine. But uh, it, so that's if if you want to do that, you can. But generally, it's better to use the the it's better to use the the pin set output register, the pin clear toggle uh, pin clear output register, and the pin toggle output register. And and these are all 32-bit ports. But of course, not all the pins are implemented. So so it only really uh, you should only really write ones to the actual pins. Well, to the, the actual pins you're using, uh, and you should uh, not write anything. You should leave zeros for everything else, and then they won't be affected. Okay, um, the you can also set some other features in all the GPIO pins, pull ups, pull downs. You can't, of course, do both. So you have you what you basically do. You choose up or down, and then you either choose enabled or disabled. Uh, you can change the slew rate. What is the slew rate? The slew rate is how fast the voltage will rise or fall when you uh, write a one or a zero to that pin. Um, and if you're using it as input, then it then it can perform some some uh, uh, some filtering on inputs. Uh, if they change, if they're real, just a very quick up down, then uh, and you're using a slow slew, slew rate. You can effectively filter out those those uh, very very short pulses. Uh, now that's if you want to. Uh, all right, then you have uh, drive strength or drive rate. The uh, that's the that's how much current it'll sink or source. And then then there's some other features of the pins involving uh, direct memory access rights and interrupt functions. Um, okay, um, here's here's the chip, and here's where all the ports are. Uh, I started with um, the A are in red, the B's are in blue, the greens are C's, the D's are yellow, and the E's are brown. And then the white pins are pins that are power ground. Uh, there's a power ground here. Uh, there's an analog uh, ground here. And then uh, some voltage reference low and highs here. And some analog uh, power here. And then uh, the USB port, these pins are dedicated for USB if you use USB. Um, and then some more power pins. And this V out is a, uh, 
that's a uh, that's uh, can be used for the USB port uh, because a, a, a strictly speaking a master USB port is supposed to provide uh, five volts up to 500 milliamps and and this has a voltage regulator on it that will actually do that I think um, so it'll actually implement that um, all right so and you can see uh, when you look at this like for instance the a we have a 0 1 2 3 4 5 and then 12 13 14 15 16 17 and then 18 19 and then the reset is 20 I believe it's it's a port a pin as well which can be used as something other than a reset but generally it uses a reset and it's pretty much it's it's a little tricky to get it switched off of a reset um, we used to do that in one of the labs uh, where we use code wire I don't think we'll repeat that lab this year but in any event it, it is an interesting thing and you can see B we have B 0 1 2 3 4 or sorry 0 1 2 3 and then uh, 8 9 10 11 16 17 18 19 so we have three groups of four pins each they're not contiguous and then we have port C 0 1 2 3 uh, 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 and then uh, 16 17 so we have a 14 pin 14 pins all in a row and then we have 16 17 hard to really comprehend why they did it that way and then in D we have uh, 0 1 2 3 uh, 4 5 6 7 uh, so we have an 8 an 8 pin an 8 bit port here with uh, the pins in, contigu in in continuity there and then we have the 0 1 2 3 4 5 and 20 21 22 23 so that's that's basically how how it, the ports are set up so you can see that it's not oh sorry uh, uh, I also left out uh, 23 and then 29 30 31 uh, sorry 29 30 31 and then 24 and 25 so we actually have 20 21 22 23 24 25 so that's a six pin port and then we have a three pin port here uh, 29 30 31 so it's a little strange uh, but that's how they set it up I'm sure they had some good thoughts for why they did it that way uh, and uh, so there's quite a few pins uh, but there but you have to really look at the data sheet to figure out which pins you can use okay uh, and most of these pins are brought out in the headers that you soldered onto your board and that's why we soldered the headers on in case we want to use some of these pins for other things okay um, so it, the uh, the KL twenty five Z manual, uh, the one that deals with the peripherals, is uh, is uh, posted in the uh, it's in Blackboard, and it so you really probably should try and read through chapters 10, 11, 12, and forty one. I know it's painful reading. Uh, obviously, uh, a lot of it's redundant, but just kind of flip through the pages and read as much as you can and try and sort of just get a little sense of familiarity um, we'll maybe pull that up at the end here and, and look at that um, so GPIO setup so first thing to do is to turn on the clock so there is a register in the system integration module to turn on clocks now uh, uh, let's see maybe I'll pull that up let's see um, let me see if I can pull that up relatively quickly let's see okay so that's content let's go to labs let's see I think the manuals are in the labs but I could be wrong let me make sure uh, yeah okay it's it's in the first it's in the content page PDFs for hardware manuals so you click on that there's a KL25Z manual and the ARM core. You want 99% of what we're going to talk about is going to be in the KL25Z manual. So, and then it's always better if we download it. So we will open it with Adobe. And then, uh, well, I'm going to, I think I will shrink it just a little bit. We'll do it. All right. 
Now, uh, so chapter 10 is the multiplexing chapter. If you go to chapter 10 and you scroll down just a little bit, you'll find, you'll find this table. It's in section 10.3.1. And it says KL25 signal multiplexing and pin assignments. And what we want is the 80 pin low profile quad flat pack. So that's the column you have, the first columns of when you look. And those are the pins. Those pins correlate then with the pins that I just that I covered here. So pin one should be PTE zero. Okay. And uh and sorry. And then uh yeah, pin one should be PTE zero. And actually I should should have probably done that differently. Let me just bring this back. And then yeah. All right. So pin one, PTE zero. Pin two, PTE one, and so forth. Now, default, notice what it says. The default setting is disabled. So it's not the, by default in GPIO. In, to get it to GPIO, you have to pick Alt-1. And Alt-1 is always GPIO for every pin. So if you want to, well, okay, I spoke too soon. Uh, yeah, well, it is kind of. Uh, this is low level, wake up, I don't know. It's These are some goofy things. But basically, almost all the, the, the alt ones uh, allow you to use a pin for GPIO and maybe also for a uh, interrupt mode. Uh, LLW, I think that's a low level wake up. Uh, so that's how you, they could also be used as an input to wake up from sleep. And, that, and this is a real time clock in pin apparently. Uh, or it could also be PTC1. And I think if we look at PTA, pin, forget which pin it is. Let's see, uh, go back here and look. So, sorry, pin 42. So let's look at that because that's also kind of interesting. Um, so, I guess I have to do this again. Oh, I see. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so pin 42 right here, pin 42. Notice that its default function is reset, but you can set it up as, a, as PTA 20. But uh, I'll give you a word of warning. It, it, there are some internal features that force it back into reset unless you switch a whole bunch of stuff, which is a, a little bit difficult to uh, figure out. So probably not a good idea to try and use the reset pin for anything but but a reset um, all right but anyway but it is PTA 20 um, all right so so that's so that is the uh, that that is the uh, that's chapter 10 okay now uh, the system integration module is the first thing you have to be familiar with and this is where we find the clock and the system integration module module does a whole bunch of things. And here, here are the registers in the SIM. And uh, if you look at these, there are these have all sorts of interesting functions. Notice that the ones uh, that have to do with the clock are these right here. System SIM system clock gate control four, five, six, and seven. Notice there is no system clock gate control one, two, and three are eight, nine, or any more. They're just four, five, six, and seven. So why they gave them funny numbers, I don't really know. And notice they they used four and five already here, but then they started over with four here. I don't understand the numbering conventions here. Uh, I'm sure it made sense somewhere, but uh, it's not obvious. So you just have to, you know, you just have to recognize these are a little bit goofy. Okay, so let's look at the system clock gate control module. We'll look at four, and then we'll look at uh, six and four, five, six, and seven. So four does a bunch of modules. The uh, the the uh, SPI port one, there's its clock. SPI port zero, there's its clock. The comparator, there's its clock. Uh, the USB uh, uh, OTG, uh, which I forget, it stands for. Uh, I don't know. I can't remember. Uh, but it's a type of USB uh, application, and there's its clock. And then the UART 2, 1, and 0. So when you want to use the UART, we already did this in uh, the first couple labs, 
because we used the use the UART to print out back to the console, uh, we had to turn on UART zero, and uh, so we had to set this bit right here, and and this is address four zero zero four underscore seven zero 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 hex plus uh, an offset of uh, one zero three four hex, giving us four zero zero four under eight zero three four hex. That address we had to send this bit ten to a one. Okay, and and that turns on the clock to the UART. And here's your two I2C ports, uh, the clocks for them. So the first thing you have to do is turn on the clock. So that's that's uh, that's system clock gate control register four. And then if we go down, here's register five. It turns out register five has all five ports, the clocks for all five ports, and bits 13, 12, 11, 10, and nine. So you have to turn on the, you have to turn these clocks on to configure the port. Um, I I actually think that once the port's configured, you may be able to use the port with the clock turned off. I'm not sure about that, but but for sure you can you can't configure it until you turn on the clock. And once you turn, you should leave the clock on. I'm pretty sure about that too. It may be problematic as an input. I think as an output you can still make it work though. And then here's your uh, touch sensing module clock. And here's your low power timer clock. And then there's more stuff in, in, in a system clock gate control registers six and seven. So if you have to figure those out, great. Um, we can, I guess we can look at those briefly. Here's six. It's the DAC, the ADC, the real time clock, and the, the touch sensing, uh, or no, the PWM ports two, uh, zero, one, and two, the, the peripheral interrupt timer, and the DMA multiplexer, I, don't know, you know, I guess that's the, uh, yeah, the direct memory access, um, and I don't know what FTF is, it probably says down here. Flash memory clock gate control. Oh, so if you want to write flash memory, this is how, you have to turn this clock on. And uh, <coughs> so when the, when you're, when you're, uh, Integrated development environment fl flashes the clock. One of the things it has to do is turn on this. I guess that uh, may that may just be for uh, when you're going to write the flash memory uh, in software uh, within the processor itself. Okay, and there's a DMA multiplexer clock gate control. All right, so that's six, and then uh, seven. There's just the direct memory access clock. One, one bit in that register. Okay, and you can see this is not a, all atypical. You have 32-bit registers and these, you just have, you know, well in this case, one bit's used, that's it. And now, probably the others aren't even implemented. All right, so, uh, so you can see, um, and then, then finally the port control registers, so this is where we this is where we uh, uh, this is where we do the, the wh where we do pin control, and uh, so uh, there's a pin control register for every for well for every pin in these 32-bit registers. But again, most of these aren't implemented. Uh, but for instance, in this one. Uh, port A, pin control register zero. Yeah, so A1, A2, A3, I forget, it. I went up to something in the A's. So yeah, so these are implemented, but, but many of them aren't, of course, as you saw. Only certain A uh, pins in the A port are actually implemented. Uh, they may actually be implemented on the die, just not brought out to a pin. But in any event, you're not supposed to mess with them if, if they're not uh, implemented. Uh, so if we, if we go and we look at this, uh, this shows the register. So every active pin, every pin for every, you know, that's implemented for every port, A, B, C, D, and E, has a, a pin control register for every pin. And here's what the pin control register actually does. When you set the multiplexer setting, there are three bits that set it, and they're right here for each pin. So you can look on the table in, in chapter 10, and you can see what the setting has to be for that pin, but the actual setting goes right here. Now there, there, uh, there are functions that'll set that for you, and we saw some of those when we looked at the first labs. Um, uh, so, 
so that that helps us a little bit but you could just set them directly if you wanted you can just write those three bits 10 9 and 8 in and you can calculate the the, the, the address base plus the offset um, and it'll get you to the right register for each pin uh, for each port so that's the multiplexer setting and then we've already talked about some of these things we'll talk about them again in a minute but the uh, so we have the ISF and that's the interrupt uh, status flag right here and one means uh, that an interrupts detected a zero means it's not this is what has to be cleared when an interrupts caused so that you don't immediately re-interrupt and usually it has to be cleared manually uh, although sometimes when you read a port uh, for some of the modules uh, th these are for the individual pins and they have to be cleared manually but uh, for some of the modules uh, some things get cleared automatically when you read the, the buffer or, or something here's your here's your interrupt uh, control field um, and or interrupt configuration I guess uh, and basically what this does this this causes different activities based on the interrupt so uh, if you just have this field zeroed it's a standard um, uh, it's just disabled and then if you have it uh, uh, if you have one two or three you're actually uh, initiating a DMA request and if you have four or five six uh, no it's actually uh, nine ten eleven and twelve you're actually generating an interrupt and you can interrupt on a logic zero so if the pins normally one and it drops to zero that can cause an interrupt if the pin uh, if you want to interrupt on a logic edge you can if you interrupt on a falling edge you can it, either edge you can or if you inter want to interrupt on a level of a, just a logic one you can do that too so you get all these uh, you get all these different choices uh, for your interrupt and so so that's kind of nice um, and then then we have uh, we already talked about the multiplexer setting and then we have these these single bit fields here the DSE the P the PFE the SRE the PE and the PS now the uh, the PE is the pull up enable and the and the PS is whether it's pulled up or down uh, the uh, so the DSE I think I have this on another slide so we'll hit it again but that's the drive strength the PFE is the passive filter enable that that's got to do with slew rate when the uh, this will this will basically uh, filter out really super fast changes on input pins little glitches uh, and then the SRE the SRE is the slew rate enable and uh, fast slew rate uh, so and slow slew rate and basically that just uh, it, that only that only affects outputs so that just changes how fast the output uh, goes up or down when you go from a zero to a one and uh, the reason for that is just to uh, just to give you some control over uh, how fast that changes um, okay and it of course it takes more energy to change quicker all right I think I think that's and then the only other thing that we wanted to look at um, so you do have a single register for each port that gives all of the uh, interrupt status flags in one register uh, so you can see all the flags in one register they're just replicated over here uh, in each individual register but they're all mapped to this other register as well and then if you needed to set a whole bunch of pins all at once you can use these two registers and and set a number of uh, number of uh, pin control registers very quickly uh, so that's just one other feature okay then um, yeah I think that's it now let's see uh, I believe that's it uh, let me just see if we go down to uh, Yeah, and this just explains those. We don't really need to get into these. And uh, okay, and I think that's it for that chapter. And then, yeah, we did. We already did. And then, uh, let's see. I may not I may not talk about this other one because I'm. Uh, yeah, give me a. 
Hold on a second here. Yeah, so the uh, chapter 41 uh, is general purpose input output. So that's the other chapter that really helps you kind of sort this out. And if you go to this, it it does. It's a good. It's good to read through this chapter and sort of get just some sense. And one of the things it does, uh, it 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 talks about the uh, the the ports, uh, port A, port B, port C, port D, and port one. And uh, so uh, port yeah. Port A, B, C, D, and E. Uh, and again, this says port A 31 through port A 0, but of course you know only certain ones are actually implemented, right? Um, all right, so so then we, we have some, uh, uh, this talks about how, uh, how the registers are defined. We have, so here's how they're set up. This is for port A, but it's the same for all of them. We have a port data output register so that's where you can actually directly read all the pins, uh, or actually you can uh, you can write all the pins. Um, here you have the port set output. So this is the uh, port set output register. So that's where you set a pin. That's the, we just looked at that, and then the pin clear output register and the pin toggle output register. There's the 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 port pin direct data input register. So that's where you can actually uh, read the data coming in. And here's the data direction register. So this is where you set the pins up for either input or output. Now in this in this chip, let's go look at this one. See, we're, we're on page uh, 774, so we'll come back here. If you look at this, zero, a pin is configured for input. One, pin is configured for output. So remember, this is the exact opposite the way the PIC set up. PIC is a zero for output and a one for input, and the KO25Z is a zero for input and a one for output. So you just have to remember. So a one in any of these positions uh, makes it an output, and a zero in any of these positions makes it an input. Okay, and then we just have to go back a few. Yeah. All right, and then, um, and then we have, uh, let's see, where were we up here? A pin set output, pin data direction register, um, DDR. So we just looked at that. And then the pin data output register, uh, sorry, the port data output register. Uh, and yeah, so that was, that was A, now this is B. So they're gonna repeat these, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven registers for every port. And uh, if we go look at this one, so the port data output register, which would be for GPIO A, B, C, D, or E, uh, this register configures the, logic, configures the logic levels that are driven on each general purpose pin. Uh, it, it also reminds you, don't modify uh, registers associated with pins not available in your package. So. All unbounded pins not available will default to disable state for lowest power consumption. Yeah, so it tells you not to mess with them. Uh, okay, uh, so these are these are the outputs. Now I, there is I, there is a register we can read for the inputs. Uh, yeah, let's see, pin clear, pin toggle. Oh, this is the port data input register. Yeah, and this this is where you read the port. So when you want to read the port, if you wanted to read the whole port, you have, you read it through this, this port data input register. GPIO, say A underscore PDIR, then you read all 32 bits, but of course you're only interested in certain ones because the other ones, we're gonna read zeros anyway. Um, and again, it reads zero if the logic level on the input zero, and a one if the logic level is one. And uh, yeah, so those are the two registers where you can read. You can read the you can read the inputs in the GPIO X PDIR, and you can write the outputs in the GPIO GPIO X PDOR. But normally we don't use the DOR unless you're going to write a whole byte at once or something. Uh, normally we use the pin set, pin toggle, pin clear. Okay, so that's pretty much uh, all you have to read in this chapter. Uh, 
And I think that's pretty much, let's see if we go for the back, see what else is in. Um, yeah, there's some few other, yeah, so that's pretty much all it's in that chapter. Okay, I'm going to, so that's, so that's, that's the manual. Again, chapters 10, 11, 12, and 41 in the manual. So I encourage you to, I encourage you to look through those chapters. Um, okay, so the first step is to turn on the clock. And uh, you use the, uh, the, the SIM output, SIM integration module, underscore, system clock gate control register, uh, either four, five, six, or seven. For all the ports, it's always five. And so that's where you have to go. Second is to set the multiplexer for the GPIO uh, uh, for the chosen pins. And so there is a function that allows you to do that without having to figure out where to write the bits in, the, in, you know, in what 32-bit register. But, but it is in the pin control register for each port. So it would be like for port A, pin 0, it would be GPIO A underscore uh, pin PCR, pin control register, zero and that, that's where you would find the multiplexer setting for uh, the the uh, PTA zero pin uh, thirds can configure the pin in in the port X so uh, so um, and So what you said in that is, you know, slew rate, um, whether you're going to use interrupts, all the all those various settings, and then then you can set the uh, then you can set uh, the data direction register, and then you can set the initial output value. I don't know why I put these backwards. That's just the way I've been doing it forever. But it's probably makes more sense to think of you know switch these. All right. So that's that's basically the GPIO setup, and then. Um, I already went through this in the actual uh, actual code. So turn the clock on to the uh, to to the whatever port. And again, those are always going to be in system clock gate control register five. Sim underscore SGC uh, SCGCS or SCGC five. Okay, and uh, and you know and and. If you don't know where those bits are, the good news is they're uh, they're mnemonics that you can use to help. They're 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 uh, built-in masks you can use to help you with that. Okay, and then uh, we also have uh, there's a few other registers in here which we at some point may may look at later on, but for right now you can kind of not pay attention to. Uh, and then then here's. Then here's the uh, the multiplexer uh, pin assignments. Uh, so I think I've I think I've really said all this. Uh, I'm gonna skip through this. Um, the other uh, functions in the pin control register are pull ups, pull downs, slew rates, driver rates, and other features, uh, which are fields to set the interrupt function, the DMA function, and the interrupt flag. Okay, we looked at this table in chapter 10. This is the multiplexer table, and it shows you for each pin in our 80 pin low quad, uh, low profile quad flat pack package, uh, what what the uh, what the pin name is, uh, and they're mostly uh, PT uh, one of the ports PTA, PTB, PTC, PTD, PTE something. Um, some of them have other names like VSS, VDD. Uh, VSSA, v, VDDA for the analog uh, ground and power. The reason they separate out the analog ground and power is so that uh, you can uh, keep uh, switching noise out of your A to D converter and, uh, and get more accurate results. In fact, uh, if you're really going for super accurate, they want you to actually put the chip in sleep mode so that only the A to D converter is working and, uh, and that actually uh, uh, cleans a lot of switching noise out and gives you even more accurate results. Uh, it's a lot of work to do that, uh, a little, little over, extra overhead to do that, but if you're really looking for a robust uh, 
minimal noise application, that might be a smart way to go. Um, all right. Uh, we looked at this. So we pretty much looked at this uh, all the way. Um, Yeah, and I talked about the global pin uh, control high and low registers. The high register does uh, pins 31 uh, through uh, 15, and the low does 14 through, or maybe it's uh, 16, and the low does uh, 0 through 15, something like that, because you can get all the functions in one register. So if you have to configure a whole bunch of pins, it, th these, these can speed that up. Um, okay, and then these are the... The, the port uh, registers, which are discussed in chapter 41. Again, we just looked at this. The data direction, the pin data output, uh, the pin uh, uh, clear output, pin set output, pin toggle output, and then the uh, pin data input. So this is the port data output register and the port data input register. So if you want to read the pins, you have to use this one. If you want to write them directly, you have to use this, but generally we prefer to use these but obviously if you're going to write eight bits at a time or something then you'd want to use this one instead okay uh, okay and uh, yeah and um, remember that output is a one and an input's a zero in the data direction register that that by the way that is the pin data input register not the pin data uh, so I should fix that right now uh, let's see. Um, pin. Uh, pin. It's P D D R. Okay. Yeah, it's it's the data direction register, not the data input register. When you set the port, uh, the pin as an input or an output. All right, so these are some of the commands we can actually issue. I think these will work in our in our uh, new uh, uh, in our new IDE, but I'm actually not sure. Uh, so we'll we'll have to uh, mess around with that a little bit. It depends on if whether the include files use the same masks or not, and I don't know if they do. I think they actually handle the multiplexer function a little differently, so we'll have to modify these a little bit. Uh, and, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically rewrite the, the original um, lab for the, R, for the RGB, but use uh, the correct uh, terminology for the new IDE. Okay. Um, okay, I think we did covered all that. Uh, let's see. We're at 47 minutes. I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to, I think I'll cover the interrupts here. Uh, so, I want to go over this because the interrupts are much more complex on this chip than they are on uh, the PIC chips that we've used. Uh, PIC chip uh, doesn't have a lot of things that this one has. Now, some of the advanced PIC chips do, obviously. This is a 32-bit chip. If you compare a 32-bit to 32-bit chip, you'll find a lot of similarities. Uh, the microchip 30-bit chips are very powerful, too. Uh, and they have very powerful interrupt features and so uh, I have not played with the the microchip 32-bit chips much so I'm not much of an expert on those at all in fact I don't know much about them at all uh, but I know that uh, the, the the several of those chips are incredibly powerful and complex so um, yeah so but this is a this is a nice you know this scale 25z is a pretty cool little chip all right, so let's look at the interrupts. So first off, why do you need an interrupt? Well, hopefully in Micro 1 you learned, you know, the, the, how an interrupt can be really helpful and uh, how it can... Uh, if you don't use interrupts and you're waiting on an event, then you have to pull on that, on a pin or a flag, which would be, basically be a pin. What that means is you have to be in a tight loop, checking it over and over and over again, and doing nothing else. Now, normally, uh, that's that's kind of wasteful. I mean, you would like for your processor to be able to do other things, and have the event get the processor's attention using an interrupt, not having the processor just staring at a pin, essentially, and waiting for it to change. 
Uh, and so that's why interrupts are so nice. And the other thing that's nice is um, that that if you have a, 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 it also can give you a very fixed amount of time between when an event occurs and when you read in the information. And that helps you with, uh, that helps you with jitter uh, so that you're not having a variable amount of time between each time you want to read a sample. So, so when you sample a signal, you really want to sample it at, a, at precise intervals. Because if you don't, you're essentially uh, modulating your input signal with your variation in your sampling interval. And so that just in, introduces more noise and confusion in your, in your original single signal that you're sampling. So you don't want to do that. So you, you want to have very precise sampling. Well, the way to do that is to set up a timer and have the timer create an interrupt and then have an interrupt where your latency from when the interrupt occurs to when the sample is actually collected by the A to D converter be a very, very uh, fixed interval with not much variation in it, or jitter, as we say. We don't want a lot of jitter because that jitter constitutes modulation of the original signal. It will be, it will be convolved in with the original signal to just confuse your, your information a little bit. So you don't want jitter, you, you want pr uh, a nice fixed latency. And you want the latency to be as brief as possible too. Uh, so that you uh, can have as, ma as fast a sampling rate as possible. Because if you have a long latency, that just adds delay to your ability to take samples. And so then that means that, that the space between samples is greater, which means your sampling frequency is lower. So obviously your bandwidth that you can actually sample is, is, uh, is, is half of your sampling frequency. And so the higher your sampling frequency, the bigger your bandwidth and the and more information you can sample. So there are a lot of reasons why, uh, why you want uh, to use interrupts when you sample a signal. And, uh, and you, want them, you want them to have a predictable latency and you, want to, and you want to have fast response. Well, one of the things that helps, uh, helps this along is a, is a pretty sophisticated interrupt system. Um, We'll talk about that. So you, what if you had brief events that are faster than your polling loop? You'd miss them entirely if you were polling. But if you use interrupts you, you, and you, they're quick with short latency, you, then you might be able to catch them. And then, of course, rare events, huge time waster to poll for a rare event. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? Sit there forever doing nothing uh, for maybe an event that happens once a week or something like that. To handle a very frequent event and still do other things, yes. So even when you have very frequent events, your interrupt can allow you to still get some other processing done in between these frequent events. Um, so, uh, so, so we do really like we do really like interrupts. They're just super helpful in a lot of ways. Uh, you can implement them simply, or you can have a lot of layers of complexity. You can have a bunch of sources of interrupts or just a few sources of interrupts. You can have all interrupts treated with the same priority, or you can have different levels of priority. Now, in, in the PIC, they're all treated at the same level, and uh, they all go to the same interrupt service routine, and then you have to figure out if you have more than one interrupt, what was it that actually caused the interrupt, which adds time and latency. So you don't, you don't, you know, you'd prefer not to do that in a sophisticated chip. Uh, and then when you go, when you stop a, a process and you go service and interrupt, you would really like not to have to use software in your interrupt service routine to, to save things that you're going to modify so you can restore them when you're done and return back to your normal processing. And so that's one of the advantages where there's there's hardware context saving. Now, the PIC actually has that. It has these shadow registers where it saves all the important registers and allows you to run your serv interrupt service routine without having to spend time saving anything. So, so that's a nice, that's a fairly sophisticated advanced feature that's built in. This, the KL25Z, of course, has this as well. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, 
And then you can have uh, fewer many special resources available for the interrupt code, like a separate stack, multiple vector locations, ability to handle nested interrupts, and all sorts of other things, uh, which this chip pretty much does. Uh, so an interrupt then is hardware that's triggered by an event that's able to stop the processor where it's currently executing a program, save the information, and jump to another part of the program memory and start executing a program there, which we call interrupt service routine or an ISR. That takes care of the event and then returns to the original code when it finishes. Okay, so uh, we see this in when we use our desktop and laptops all the time because anytime we move the mouse, we're, we're creating an interrupt and the interrupt causes an interrupt service routine to service our mouse motion. Uh, and then it, it updates the movement, goes back, it, the mouse continues to move, so it comes back and updates it again, goes back, the mouse continues to move, continues to update it. So it's just continually being interrupted when you're moving the mouse around. Uh, and, and it's making these slight adjustments very, very fast, uh, you know, thousands of times a second to track your mouse movement. Uh, but of course, if, if uh, there are other things that are higher priority that start interrupting your processor, you may see some, um, you may see some stuttering in your, in your mouse tracking. <coughs> okay. So in the simple PIC processor that we use, the KL25, uh, the, uh, sorry, the, uh, the PIC 16F1829, the, the interrupts are disabled whenever you uh, first start the program or do a reset, you have to, then you have to set the, the global interrupt bit, uh, and then you have to set, uh, if there are any uh, other, uh, you have to set up all your other interrupt bits, uh, and, and, and you may have to set up a peripheral interrupt enable bit, uh, and then use a peripheral interrupt enable register, zero, uh, one, two, or three, or four, I think there's four of them, I think. Um, so, so you have to do a few things to set them up. In the, uh, yeah, so, so the way the, uh, I, I don't know, this is the, this is the pick. I, I don't know, maybe I'll, we'll go through this briefly, but basically the way this sequence events, it's very similar to the KL25Z, right? So the current, the current prefetched instruction is flushed out of the pipeline. The global interrupt enable bit is cleared, which keeps interrupts from other interrupts from occurring. Now that doesn't happen in the KL25Z. In the KL25Z, the the interrupt controller can respond every time an interrupt flag occurs, and it compares it. If, if you're already in an interrupt, what it does, it checks the priority of the current interrupt that's being executed and if the new interrupt is higher priority, it will interrupt the current interrupt service routine that's running. But if the interrupt is the same priority or lower priority, it won't interrupt it. Whereas in the, in the PIC, you do not allow an interrupt service routine to ever be interrupted. Uh, it runs the completion, goes back, and then if the if there's another interrupt that's ready to cause interrupt, then it'll go back and execute that second interrupt immediately. <coughs> um, but but in the but in the KL25Z, there are four levels of priority. So in theory, you could start the lowest priority interrupt. Uh, next priority could it could occur could interrupt that. The next could occur and interrupt that. And finally, the highest priority interrupt could occur and interrupt that last one. So that you would then finish the high priority, then finish the next to high, the next to next to high, and finally the low priority interrupt, and then you go back to your mainline routine. And uh, the reason that the PIC doesn't really want to do that is because it has a 16-level hardware stack, and <coughs> you don't want to run the risk of adding four levels in the stack that you weren't counting on and maybe uh, maybe your interrupt service routine even calls a function and so if each inter interrupt service routine called a function and you had four levels uh, you could actually be eight levels down just from the interrupt and if you had a couple of other functions running in your main routine 
you could easily exceed your 16. So it's just impractical on a on a on a chip with a hardware stack that's limited. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so I think I'm gonna um, yeah, I think we've done this. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna skip on. So the KL25Z is much more complicated. So. So the built-in capability for a real-time operating system adds a lot of complexity. So one of the things that, that the KL25C does, you can use a real-time operating system with it. I guess you could use one with a PIC 16F1829, but it's not really set up for that. Now, in all fairness, when Freescale implemented the ARM M0 Plus core on this chip, they did not include one of the really powerful features for, for an RTOS to use, which was a separate stack pointer. Uh, this there are actually in the in the M0 plus core the potential for two separate stack pointers uh, one for uh, the operating system uh, and then one for the applications and that way uh, you can you can have the operating system can sort of keep track of where it is and what it's doing all the time uh, and then each application can have its own Paul Morton. Okay, well, that was one of my students trying to come to the house to get their KL25Z Freedom Board. All right, so um, so here are some features that the KL25Z has that that the PIC didn't really have. So uh, first off, it has the ability uh, for multiple levels of interrupt priority. Secondly, it has built-in system uh, exceptions that aren't in the PIC. Now, these are these are things that happen like on your desktop or your uh, or your laptop, where an application uh, executes some bad code and causes a blue screen or causes it to abort the application. Uh, so you can actually have that with this chip, uh, and. Uh, some of these, like one of the exceptions is uh, your, your, your half word and your full word loads and stores have to be correctly byte aligned. I'll explain that later, but basically uh, if you're doing, if you're writing a 32-bit word out to a memory location, it has to start on, that memory location has to, has to either start on 0, 4, 8, or C, or it's invalid. It can't, like if it starts to, at a draw, at an address is something 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 three that would be illegal and it would generate a interrupt a system level interrupt which if you had an operating system then it would say this application just did something bad and it would uh, issue some kind of corrective action either terminate the application or uh, restart it or something I don't know uh, but since we're not going to run uh, we probably we might run our task because there's there's some RTOS examples uh, uh, that that are available for us, so maybe we will do one. But um, but generally, we 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 don't run into these exceptions. Like in the PIC, there aren't any. Another exception is divide by zero. Um, well, the PIC doesn't even. So if you had a little routine uh, that was doing divide by zero, normally you check for that, and and uh, and I mean, you basically have some way of not getting into a divide by zero situation. In in this in this KL25Z, uh, there is there is a an interrupt for divide by zero, and there's so, there's several others. Uh, so 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 these are called exceptions, system traps. They have different names, but they're all basically interrupts. Um, the the KL25 is a little more complicated. With its comp with its context saving, so when you interrupt something uh, in the PIC, you you have a, a set one set of shadow registers. That's why you can't have, and that's another reason why you can't have two interrupts. These shadow registers are hardware locations, and there's only one of them. They're one level deep. So once you've interrupted, you filled them up with the return information, and you have to return using that information in those registers, you can't do another interrupt because there's no other shadow registers to store that in. 
But in the KL25Z, we, we push the information onto a, onto a stack. And the stack is relocatable, so it's somewhere out of memory. And uh, as long as we don't run out of memory for the stack, everything's fine. Uh, and, you know, our memory is, what, 8K, so we have a fair, fair number of locations we can use, so generally it's going to be okay. And normally, the way we do this, we start, this, we start variables that the program's using at the bottom of the random access memory, and we build upwards at higher level, higher memory locations. So we start at memory location 0, and we go to 2, 3, 4, 5, or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever. The stack starts at the highest random access memory location, and pushes down. And as long as your your variables and, and arrays and other things don't run into the top of the memory of the variables doesn't run into the bottom of the stack, everything's fine. Uh, but if it does, that would cause a problem. Uh, and it might not even be a problem that the system would, would be able, uh, the system might not detect its problem. Now I think in Windows, uh, Windows is smart enough to know to to know that that could happen and it's going to prevent it, hopefully, because it generally uh, provides a protected area of memory for your application to run in. And then if you need more memory, you have to you have to allocate it. And the system knows what can and cannot be allocated. And so, and it also, in, it, it, it basically uh, keeps surveillance to make sure that your application doesn't get out of where it's supposed to be. Now, this is, of course, one of the areas where security problems come into play. And in big servers, uh, if one application can get out of its assigned memory by cheating somehow, uh, then that's a security that's a security vulnerability, and that's what gets exploited by the by these viruses uh, that can really screw some systems up. Um, all right, so so in the case of uh, the KL25Z, then our context saving. Uh, gets done on this on stacks and you can have then you can do it multiple times as long as you don't exceed your entire stack capacity then finally uh, we have some pretty complicated bus structures because not only do we have interrupts happening but we can also have direct memory access happening and when and what this means this DMA is a very powerful feature totally not available on our low level pick but the DMA allows the, the allows uh, transfers from uh, from very from one place to another place maybe say a classic example would be you re, you you uh, read a value in through your A to D converter and now it's finished the conversion the value is ready to be stored uh, you can D, you can do a direct memory access transfer from the uh, a to D module directly into random access memory without the processor uh, being involved at all. It's out there doing other things, other tasks, and it doesn't have to lift its finger to make that happen. It, it does have to set it up initially, but once it sets it up, it will automatically happen uh, when the DMA uh, conversion finishes and raises its flag. That will trigger the DMA transfer, and it will go automatically through one of the four DMA bus channels into the memory. Now it does have to deconflict it with a simultaneous memory writer read by the processor obviously, but as long as you don't have that going on, uh, this will happen uh, completely independent of the processor. And that, that's a very powerful feature and it, it allows you to move data around inside the chip without tying up the processor. Um, in the KL25Z uh, all the all all the ports, all the pins, uh, the GPIO pins can cause an interrupt. They can all be programmed to do that. In the in the PIC, uh, the we can only I think it's only ports uh, B and C can cause uh, the interrupt on change, and I think port A can't. Uh, or maybe I have that wrong. But anyway, it, it it's limited. Um, and in the earliest picks, there was only one external pin that could cause an interrupt. But of course, most of the modules can also cause interrupts. <coughs> and then on the on on of course, and on on the KL25Z, there are quite a few modules with autonomous functions, uh, autonomous modes of operation that could cause interrupts. Whereas on our uh, pick 16F1829, that that's uh, 
there are there is some of that, like the UART uh, can cause interrupts uh, when it receives a character, for instance. But um, and that's basically autonomous. Uh, but uh, like the A to D module, you have to start each conversion, and it can it can interrupt on completion. But then uh, and your interrupt service routine could start another conversion, so you could have it set up semi-autonomous. But in the uh, in this KL twenty five Z, you can have it set up completely autonomous and even use DMA transfers to store the information uh, in memory someplace. So it's pretty cool. All right. So so on our on this KL twenty five Z chip, we have the ability for the software to cause an interrupt. For the hardware to cause an interrupt, and for this, and for system exceptions like errors, traps, faults, aborts, to also cause interrupts. Uh, we can wake up from sleep on an interrupt. You saw, hopefully, you saw that. Hopefully, you did it. The sleep lab when you did micro one, although we only done it in the last two semesters. And then, uh, and there's also these things called non-maskable interrupts, which means you can't turn off the interrupt. Uh, it's always on and out, always activated. Um, so what happens with the interrupt? So the event raises a flag in a register and it has a priority assigned to it. Uh, so it has to be enabled by setting bits in another register or else it will be masks unless it's a, a non-maskable interrupt. Okay. Then the current instruction is either finished or aborted and the PC is saved along with registers in the program model. Now the reason we have this either finished or aborted is because uh, the KO25Z has multiple byte instructions uh, or multiple step instructions where you can move uh, a, a several bytes of memory uh, can 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 be moved around and and so if you if you didn't have the ability to abort that instruction you would have uh, the potential for really big big variations in your latency uh, to service the interrupt and that would cause terrible jitter not just a little bit of jitter, it wouldn't even be jitter anymore, it'd be colossal jitter. Uh, it would be, uh, you know, it would really screw your sampling up. You just have a, you just have a total gap in your data. So you don't want that. So, so for these multi-step instructions, you just abort them. And otherwise you finish the, the single step instructions, you just go ahead and finish them. And then, and then you execute the interrupt. The inter execution jumps to an address specified by the interrupt vector. Now, this is one major difference in the feature. In in the PIC, all interrupts go to location four in the 18 in the you know in the PIC 16F 1829. But in the KL25Z, uh, there is a table in memory that has the address that's assigned to every possible interrupt that could occur. So every interrupt, uh, there's a table of them, and there's maybe I don't know 60 or something like that. And every every one of those 60 has a uh, a location that it's assigned. Now, the way they actually set the table up, they use what are called weak aliases. So they put in the table uh, the name of the interrupt service routine, and and it's it's a type of weak. It's typed as weak alias, which means that if there is no other name that's the same then it'll use that, but if there's another name that's the same, it will substitute that address in. So when you want to, so as long as you don't need an interrupt, if it were to happen to occur, there'd be a place for it to go in the interrupt routine, which would just be a dummy, uh, a dummy ISR just to do a return. But, uh, but if you write in, an, in, a, in a routine that has the same name, it'll substitute your name for the weak alias name in the table, and then it will jump to wherever the compiler puts that your you know your ISR, and and so, so so that execution then so you can so you can have say an interrupt on port A pin one, an interrupt on the A to D converter, and an interrupt on port A pin two, and an interrupt on say a PWM uh, channel, and maybe an interrupt on another pin for an input or something whatever, and. Uh, and say so you have five different interrupt sources you could assign them different priorities and each one would have their own interrupt service routine uh, that you would write specifically for that interrupt and when those interrupts would occur because of using the interrupt vector table <coughs> you would jump directly to the correct uh, interrupt service routine for that particular interrupt and based on that particular priority 
And uh, if the priority was lower than an interrupt already running, then it, then it would have to wait its turn. And if it were higher priority, it could interrupt that. So it's pretty powerful. Uh, so the programmer's model is saved in the hardware on the stack, so all the registers can be restored during the interrupt of service. The code is pointed to by uh, the vec the code pointed to by the vector is called the ISR, and it begins executing. Typically, the other interrupts are inhabited by the ISR or automatically by hardware and priority level, but higher priority interrupts will be allowed. And when the ISR finishes, it restores all the original registers and executes a return from interrupt instruction that continues the original code wherever it left off. All right. <clears throat> And uh, so, so the the port module has the following features. So the the interrupt on selected pins. Remember we looked at that, and you you have a field where you can select DMA or interrupt. You can interrupt on a rising edge, a falling edge, both edges, a high or a low, and you can also do DMAs on various uh, level changes. And then the we have all the uh, all the port control issues here. I'm not going to go through all that. I think I'm in a <coughs> and we've we pretty much talked about this already. Um, it is a memory mapped. Uh, it has it's memory mapped architecture. It's memory mapped I/O. All all of, everything in this chip that has an address finds itself in the same four gigabit address space or four gigabyte for the yeah, four, four gigabyte address space, yeah. And um, each location is one byte. And um, there, it does reserve uh, E0000000 to FFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFF
Uh, we'll have some micro students probably down, micro one students downstairs probably, but we'll be upstairs mostly uh, helping our micro two folks. Um, we are working on the tail tables and getting them, uh, getting all the, the new boards set up and ready to go. And uh, got to uh, had have some good help on getting that done. And so we're making some good progress on that. Um, okay, I can't think what else. Uh, Yeah, you know, this is interesting. It didn't really, yeah, I don't know why. It's been a little offset the whole time. Hope I didn't screw things up. All right. Well, anyway, okay, so I think that covers everything. Um, we will, um, yeah, I. so hopefully, uh, um, hopefully we'll get all that done and we'll have, a, we'll have a good week in lab. You're always welcome to come, but you should be able to get this done at home as well. So it, your choice, but if you need to, feel free. If anybody doesn't have their parts yet, please uh, get in touch with me and, and uh, let's get that done so you can get working on the labs. And we'll talk to you later.